It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Nick Begich. He is speaking on harp and mind control. Let me let me also say that there will be the just about just around 8:45. We're going to allow time for at least 15 minutes of question and answers, Q and A. So we would, you know, we encourage you to wait till that period of time. Now Nick has written five books on what I would call exotic and covert technology and its effects. As an example of his expertise in this area, just one example, Nick served as an expert witness for the European Par Parliament. Let's give Nick a warm hand. Thank you all for being here and uh, for Laura for putting this together and a whole bunch of other people uh, behind the scenes volunteering. And I've just been traveling around the last uh, month in the Southwest and one of my plans was to see one of my, my friends, Richard Miller. Whenever I say, hey Richard, I'm going to come by to visit, he always seems to gather a bunch of people <laughs> So here we are. I came for a visit and I, I meet about a hundred new friends. So it's uh, Richard's typical style and I appreciate Laura and her husband and everyone for uh, organizing this. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about HARP. I'm going to talk about uh, mind effects. Uh, I know this is like really an uncomfortable space at this point because you have people hanging out in the hallway. But we'll do the best we can. We'll take a short break, um, as, as the MC uh, Doug said, and um, sort of midway through. And then we'll take questions at the end. So I'd ask you to hold your questions. A couple of seats over here. If there's some vacant seats, we've got, we've got one over here. So maybe there's someone in the back that could use that. Um, any other seats out there that anybody's got free? There's at least two over here. Okay, a couple of them over here, so let's at least use those. Um, so I want to start with a little bit, uh, I can give a little bit more background, and I don't want to forget to mention my website, and I'm going to mention it now so people can pay attention to it, because I'm going to forget about it later. But it has a lot of articles, there's a lot of free material there, there's probably 700 pages of data that back up some of the things that I'm talking about here tonight. The books that we have, you probably find them in, and there used to be a really great metaphysical library here. I understand that it's not, not open these days, but bookstores, libraries have my books. They're all extremely well footnoted. Uh, everything I'm going to talk to you tonight about is cited in there so you can look up these sources, and I think that's incumbent on all of us when you're conveying information as controversial nature as this. I, I use the PowerPoint only because somebody told me a long time ago I needed to use PowerPoints because people need PowerPoints and I don't really like them very much so I'm going to probably screw that up a little bit and Michelle's helping me push the button. Uh, so we'll start with this button and I'll probably forget a few buttons along the way but that's the way it goes. Um, this is a place uh, near, my, near my home uh, in Alaska. I live just a couple hours north of um, Anchorage. Uh, this is a little bit south of Anchorage Portage Pass area. and. Harp is where my work started. Uh, anybody in this room not heard about Harp? Yeah. See, that's a big change from 20 years ago when I started doing this work. And everybody looked at me like, what? What's Harp? Okay, so that's good. Let's go to the next slide there, Michelle. Um, and, and this just helps me with talking points so I don't forget something. And if we can figure out how to work the machine, we'll flip it one. Just for center. Okay, rehearsal. Oh, okay. Did you get it? Yeah, for some reason. We got another tech player. This is yeah, the technology we can't even get through the video. All right, the visuals. So harp. What is harp? It's an array, a field of antennas. Um, originally, uh, it was, it was relatively small. Now it's about 180 antennas. Each of these is about 60 feet high, just to give you some perspective. Um, there's 180 in the array, um, and, and as we talk about this. These generate radio frequency energy. Now, most of you, of course, listen to radio from time to time. And when you think about, if you ever think about, uh, the energy that comes off of a radio frequency tower, broadcast tower, that energy spreads out very rapidly with distance. The same is true if I were to shine a flashlight against the wall. The beam is small here and it's wide there. The same principle applies to radio frequency energy. Now, if you think about a laser, right, a laser compacts that energy, keeps it tight, so if I shine that light on the wall, it's a real narrow beam. And you can do a lot of things with lasers. 
that are different from what you do with a flashlight, correct? Same is true with radio frequency energy. If we can focus it or concentrate it, then we can do some other things with it, different than just broadcasting a radio um, broadcast or microwaving your oven in the microwave. Right? So what they were looking at here was a way to focus the energy and send the energy up into the ionosphere, and the ionosphere is a layer that begins about 30 miles above the Earth's surface and continues on for maybe maybe four, five, six hundred miles out from there. And this is an energized layer. When the sun has solar flares, and we all hear this on some of the talk shows we hear about, about solar flares and Carrington event and these kinds of things that disrupt communications and disrupt um, radio and television broadcasts. Well, the sun does this naturally, of course, and if we can figure out how to stabilize the ionosphere, maybe we can learn how to um, control our radio uh, communications at a time when maybe the sun is creating those disturbances. So this was the premise under which HARP kind of got started. was let's learn more about the ionosphere. Let's figure out what this thing is. Can we manipulate? Can we change it? Can we stabilize it with an instrument on the ground? So that's kind of where um, HARP got started. So let's catch the next slide. This is another image. This is in its earlier stage when it was 48 array. This is when I first started the work in this, um, was talking about this particular array. And here's power station, uh, small antenna array. This actual region is a 5,000 acre area that was previously set up for the backscatter radar just before the Cold War ended. A backscatter was a kind of radar that would allow us to look over the horizon for incoming objects, uh, internet continental ballistic missiles, and this kind of thing. HARP um, replaced that technology in a, in a lot of ways. As a developmental prototype, what they found with, with HARP is you can create an over the horizon radar effect and you actually need two transmitters, and we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through this. But in this case, over the horizon, instead of just seeing things you know, that are at a great height or a great distance, this one allows you a high level of resolution to where you can actually distinguish those objects on a, on a very close trajectory, something backscatter couldn't do. So if it was way out there, you could see it, but as it got closer and closer in, the images got distorted. With HARP, you can actually um, keep those images, in other words, see those images from ICBM, real high elevations, to cruise mess missiles height, which are very low elevations. So you can actually see them all. Um, let's go to the next slide. This is the larger array. Now they've added into it, so you're looking at 180 antennas. The ori original plan was to jump it up to 360, and Bernard Eastland, the inventor of this technology, he envisioned something on, a, on the scale of a, a kilometer by kilometer array. Now, Having said that, Ben Eastland and I got to know fairly well before he passed away in 2007. And what he had come to is he didn't need an array that big. That the technology was advanced enough that, that, that what he deduced is that you could create uh, some of the effects that he envisioned this big kilometer array uh, being necessary for. You could do with 1,600 times less energy than when you originally con conceived of HARP. So where HARP is today at 180 antennas, applying that new technology and the knowledge he had before his death makes this like the one kilometer um, array that he originally envisioned. So much smaller, but able to do much more than he originally thought. Uh, and we'll get into that as we go through the email. Okay, another shot of the array. Let's go ahead and skip this one. All right, now a little bit of a, a graphic example. Now this came right out of Bernard Eastland's view graphs when he went to sell this idea to the um, Air Force and Navy was the original pitch. And, and what he was looking for there was a shielding effect for intercontinental ballistic missiles. So he goes in and he makes his pitch. Um, and what he's talking about is, again, affecting this area, the ionosphere, particularly these lower areas, uh, the D and E regions um, of, of the ionosphere. So next slide. So this is graphically kind of showing what I just described, the energy focused to a small area moving into the ionosphere. And in this case, this is a high-frequency array. Now, if you could see that energy coming off of that array, what it would look like is what's called cyclotron resonance. So it would be like a corkscrewing kind of motion, and the higher you get, the tighter the screw. So you think about that energy moving up. And one of the ways that they sort of saw whether that was working was a launched barium-laden rocket out of Poker Flats rocket range, which is near the University of Alaska Fairbanks, and dumped some barium in the atmosphere. And then when they energized it with HARP, they could literally see it. They give a visual image so they could see that energy spiraling exactly like they wanted it to. Let's go to the next slide. And then what they did is it actually, let's skip one forward, and I think that's a better one. Okay, you see that corkscrewing motion um, around that, that line, that dark line that you see whipping around there? 
these are these these dark lines are the natural uh, field lines, magnetic field lines of the Earth. And if you look at a bar magnet and you throw magnetic dust over it or steel, you know how you get those lines that form. The Earth has the same situation. Magnetic lines of force from the bottom, the south polar region up into the northern polar region. And where these intersect the Earth or come close to the Earth is where you get the auroras and the aurora borealis as, as the energy interacts with the chemicals in the upper atmosphere. Now, those waveguides or that energy, the natural energy is flowing from south to north. In this case, with HARP in the northern polar regions, you pump energy in in a cyclotron resonance and it literally corkscrews around those um, natural field lines and runs the other direction. So now you have electrons going this way as the magnetic field lines go this way and that's what creates in fact the shielding effect. So if some object like an intercontinental ballistic missile were to fly through there, the avionics that control this flight path get scrambled and they malfunction and they crash. That's the idea. So Eastland's original idea on this was, let's go back a slide and you'll see this original shield idea, which was the, uh, the thought that any intercontinental ballistic missile going up or coming back in hits this disturbance and that's the end. Any other incoming objects um, would, would experience the same thing. If you did this in a region where satellites were performing their function, you would cause them to malfunction and they'd crash. Now another way that you can use the system is, go forward that slide again, <clears throat> Because when you focus that energy, what they used to call these things is ionospheric heaters. Because you can literally heat a portion of the ionosphere and cause it to lift up. So if you can visualize this, imagine this layer that was in that earlier slide showing those layers of the ionosphere. Now imagine just pushing it aside for maybe 30 miles in diameter and then pushing it up a couple hundred miles. And what happens is the lower atmosphere rushes in to fill that space. And when it does, a satellite, say, crossing that space at maybe 600 miles up or 500 miles up, encounters atmosphere. And it's zipping through at 30,000 or 40,000 miles an hour, whatever it's going. And it hits that atmosphere, it disintegrates, right? It heats up and that's the end of it. You turn the thing off, the atmosphere moves back to so much space. Oh, satellite went down, don't know what happened there. And I satellite technology. And the other place they use it is incoming objects. When you think of incoming objects from space, meteors, asteroids, all these things. And, and we hear about them, and most of them break up way before they ever hit the Earth's surface. Because they encounter the friction of the atmosphere, they start breaking up, by the time they get down there, they're gone. So most of the smaller things that enter our atmosphere disappear. But imagine if you could push a column of atmosphere seven times further out, and take care of a lot bigger objects, a lot bigger things, have a lot more room to break up before they ever get the Earth. So as a anti a meteor anti-asteroid technology. This was one of the things that Russians actually were talking about um, in terms of ionosphere heaters. And Russians predate uh, Americans in this technology. They had five transmitters in the early 70s. Some will remember these. They were associated with what was called then the woodpecker signal. How many have ever heard of the woodpecker signal? Okay, it's a fair amount. This was a signal in the early 70s people heard on um, ham operators who are operating, communicating, kept hearing this you know, pecking, ticking sound, couldn't figure it out. Well, between them all, they triangulate the positions, they locate these big transmitters in the former Soviet Union, which were the precursors to HARP. In those days, to change the frequency of one of these, it took 15, 20 minutes, maybe an hour. These can be changed in milliseconds, so you can cover a whole lot of territory really rapidly and create a whole bunch of effects and compound them, unlike the old prehistoric transmitters, okay? So HARP was built to sort of take this another level up. And when Bernard Eastland invented it, it was primarily as a defense uh, shield is what he thought, but there were other applications uh, as well. Let's flip the next slide. So weather modification was one of them. I talked about lifting the uh, ionosphere. Now imagine lifting that ionosphere up and there's a jet stream moving through the neighborhood. Okay, now it's got atmosphere that's not supposed to be where it is, so jet streams can get kind of pushed around. Now when you think about a jet stream getting pushed around, I'll give you a good example. It was, um, there was an issue of Scientific American, and it was like 2002's issue, you'll have to look it up. The whole issue was dedicated to weather. And in that, they have an image of uh, the jet stream coming up through Alaska, and coincidentally, above the Hart facility, it takes this little dog leg and moves 75 miles north and about 50 miles then east, and then drops back down and follows a semi-normal trajectory, except at that time, what it did is it moved uh, the jet stream in such a way that it moved storefronts out of central Texas 
uh, into Florida and deposited a tornado in Orlando. And many of you might remember that news story quite a few years back where this, this occurred. And it was just very small jet stream change in one place creating this downstream very different effect that was unexpected and unanticipated. This is the kind of stuff Harp can do by, by a deliberate act or by an accidental side effect because <clears throat> these things happen, right? Uh, this is the problem too with military uh, research when you think about these kinds of areas. You know, when you think about the military doing research and weather modification as an example, something that's gone on for decades, going back even to the Vietnam War and even before. It used to start with chemical seeding, trying to get, trying to create a flooding situation, a stormy situation for your combatants on the other side, so they're all mucked down, can't move their equipment, you know, and you have a chance to fight a war. So that's kind of where it started, and then there were things that happened that caused uh, environmental treaties to be discussed, and they were actually ratified. 1977 started that process. We signed on with the Russians and a bunch of other countries to say we're not going to use weather modification as a weapon in war. That was pretty much everybody's consensus until Rumsfeld showed up on the scene during the Bush administration and said, you know, we need to dump that treaty like the ABM treaty because we got this great technology now that we ought to be using. Because his view, and he was kind of big on COVID wars, for those who don't remember, he kind of liked doing them without anybody knowing. Imagine having command and control of weather systems, of natural systems, be able to wage war with that, and then be invited in to kind of clean up the mess rather than fight over conventional war. Really a different way of approaching it. And I, I'm going to grab a quote, and I, got, I hate these. And I like right when I walk around with I don't like hanging on to it. Let me grab my phone. <laughs> right. And I've, I've used this in a few lectures, so it's got a little tattered, but I want to quote a couple of things to illustrate that particular point. Um, and this comes from a DOD news briefing. This news briefing was uh, April 27, uh, 1997, excuse me, April 28. And it's by William Cohen, and he says, and I quote, uh, others are engaging even in eco-type of terrorism whereby they can alter climate, set off earthquakes and volcanoes remotely through the use of electromagnetic waves. Unquote. Now that's the seat of Secretary of Defense while he's in office making that comment um, about terrorist organizations having this capability. Now stop thinking about that for a minute. <laughs> if they really have this capability, it must be really simple, all right, because they're not really known for their high science, okay? A Montauk cocktail doesn't take much rocket science. All right, but here we go. A, a technology that can influence that kind of um, change. And when we talk about HARP, a system that actually deliberately couples with part of the natural environment to alter its state to change things in a system that we really don't fully know, right? I mean, who can model this planet accurately and determine when you push on this that this is going to happen? We can't do that yet. We're just, we're kindergartners with hand grenades. It's really dangerous <laughs> right now. And, and, and the thing about it all is, weather modification as a concept, when Bernard Eason first started fielding this, you know, there was a lot of serious talk about it because we had already done a lot of things in this area. Um, he advanced it quite a bit further. He did some stuff for the European Space Agency in the early uh, part of um, this century. Uh, he did a little bit of work for FEMA and NASA on um, interdicting tornadoes with heart, being able to knock out the energy in a tornado. Now, how would that work? If you think about tornadoes, if you think about them at all, <laughs> is you've got a warm front and a cold front, they come together and they create a shearing action. And that's where you get that tornado forming. The idea was that if you could heat up that cold front sufficiently enough, when these two fronts collided, you wouldn't have that energy differential, you wouldn't have that temperature differential that would cause that shear, so you'd stop it. Or conversely, heat up the heated section Make it even more extreme so you go from a class one to maybe a class three, right? I mean, so you can use it either way, more or less. And he did work to say you could use HARP for this technology or you could use certain satellite based technology to accomplish the same thing. But the main point that he was making at that time was what his big discovery was that you could manipulate weather with 1,600 times less energy than originally anticipated because he found a way to manipulate gravitational waves with HARP that would then affect weather systems as, as you walk back through that sort of exercise. And then, and then the, the, the more obvious, uh, the heating and the moving of, of jet streams around, being able to accomplish that. One of, the, one of the other things along this line that he talked about that nobody really talks about in his patents is through radiochemistry you could create certain um, effects in the upper atmosphere. One of the things was creation of ozone. So if you buy the story that ozone depletion is the culprit, 
this is a technology that could actually add ozone in. So that's kind of interesting. And the idea of knocking out specific pollutants using radio frequency technology for knocking out certain greenhouse gases or pollutants, something that Eastland thought should be explored but was not being explored at all. Now, how many have ever heard of Rosalie Bertel in this group? Okay, not too many. Too bad. She's a great person. She's deceased now. She was um, one of the top people uh, dealing with victims of uh, radiological experiments and disasters. She uh, was a um, mathematician, a physicist, taught mathematics at Berkeley to uh, uh, doctoral students. And she was also a nun. It's kind of an interesting combination. <laughs> right down to it. But when, when she was looking at all, all of this, you know, her thing was that the military would eventually start to talk about these issues as being the justification for a system such as HARP. So from her perspective and from Ben Eastland's the inventor was HARP is a two-edged sword. What Ben said was these kinds of applications do not belong in the military's hands because they're basically kind of irresponsible people. <laughs> and not that they're irresponsible in, in the wrong way, they're irresponsible I think in the right way, but the reason we keep the military sort of in the closet is in civilian sector runs a show is because when we need them, we really need them, and then we bring them out to do something that the rest of us really don't care to do. But having said that, so much money flows in the military industrial complex today without oversight. Now, some of you will say, well, what about congressional oversight? Well, I had a father who was a congressman. I have a brother who was a U.S. senator. And I know about oversight. And there isn't any. And, and let me explain why. The biggest things in technology today, the most important things that shape a democratic republic or shape any country, is our command and control technology. Right? I mean, that's what drives modern the modern world. If you don't have technology, you're in the jungle somewhere. All right? In terms of how we view society and how things have evolved. But in technology, you have to have a little bit of knowledge to ask the right questions. If you don't have a little bit of knowledge, you're never going to ask the right questions. So here's what happens in Congress. They go into a room, a closed committee conference, for security-related issues. They cannot take their staff. They cannot take notes. They cannot talk to anybody outside the committee room about what they heard. And so they go in there and they listen to the dog and pony show of some bureaucrat telling them what this technology is all about. And they don't have enough intelligence, knowledge, education to even ask the right questions. That's our oversight. That's the problem. Because in our, in our culture, what we built here is a military industrial complex that rolls their political leadership over every couple of years. You know, and they try to convince the rest of us term limits are the answer. Well, that's the worst curse of all, I can tell you, because now you just got people every couple of years rolling in and out. A little bit of continuity, actually, they might get through that bureaucracy at some point, because bureaucrats view it differently. For them, it's, we just got to wait till the next group is installed. <coughs> because we're doing our program, because we're here for 30 or 40 years. And these guys are just passing through town. That's how it really works, folks. So, in a modern world, in a modern technology, we have to have at least a little bit of working knowledge of what this stuff does, so we can kind of weigh in on what we think it ought to do. And here's the problem with a lot of this, is the way military planners work today. There's a document that I point to often in my lectures it's called The Revolution Military Affairs, in conflict short of war. It was put together in the early 1980s by the U.S. Army uh, War College. And it sets the direction of sort of where the new technology is going. <clears throat> and they talk about this revolution as being the same as when they introduced gunpowder in the Middle Ages to Europe or when they introduced atomic weapons in the last century. What these weapons are all about is energy as the foundation. No more bombs and bullets and ordnance, things that tear tissue and break down buildings and cost a lot of money to fix. This is stuff that's going to address Strictly the operating systems, the computers and the humans, you know? Because if you take either one of those out, the game is over for modern warfare, right? You can affect the hardware in a way that causes the computers to malfunction, everything fails. If you can affect the operator, well, then you're one, one ahead of the game and you keep the hardware for the next war, right? You don't have to wipe it out and you don't have to rebuild it. This is a very dangerous time when you think about it in terms of technology because we have no oversight and we have changes in technology occurring at such a rapid rate from the invention of the wheel to where we are right now, technology will double every 10 months, more months. How do you keep up? You know, I mean, how do you really keep up with all that in a way that you know, protects the republic in a sense that we are the, that protector, right? We're the citizens supposed to run the show. 
And what we found out is, is whether Citizens United that really does, or whoever they are, that are running the reality TV show we call Modern Elections. Um, <laughs> and we've all dialed into that lately, because I can tell everyone's still laughing about it. I mean, can you believe this? This is the best that two parties can come together and figure out and present to the American people. We are in deep trouble. And we have a circus sideshow going on for presidential election. At a time when really high technology, of which this is just a symptom, one little small part, is, is moving forward. So uh, Easton's original ideas um, were amplified in, in, in all the things I just talked about. And environmental manipulation as a weapon of war. This is kind of where the drift is, is headed. Michelle, why don't we hear that one? Okay, over the horizon radar. So I talked about this. The patent numbers are there. This is again out of Eastland's um, uh, view graphs when he sold this to the military. So here we have depicted graphically two transmitters, a large one such as HARP and a smaller one. The smaller one creates, and what you see up there at the very top of that image, that sort of flat disk, that's actually a plasma, uh, a, a field of energy that's created by this smaller a transmitter. So it creates a plasma of energy uh, that acts like a mirror so it can reflect the signal from the other uh, transmitter over the horizon and that's essentially how you get that over the horizon effect. You need two transmitters to work it out. It gives you the over the horizon effect and allows you to see all the way down to cruise missile um, heights. The next slide. Now this one is a real interesting one. This again comes out of his uh, view graphs uh, and this is to create an ELF, an extremely low frequency signal. Now, I said earlier that HARP is a high frequency generator, which is what it is. <clears throat> but you can pulse that energy. So you're setting the high energy up, the high frequency energy up, and you're pulsing it. So think about it like a hammer hitting a bell. Bing, bing, every pulse of that high frequency energy hitting that ionosphere. And what it does is cause the ionosphere to resonate in harmony with the pulse rate, converting it from DC to AC, so that now acts as a broadcast antenna broadcasting that very long wavelength, that EF, ELF, EF, ELF <clears throat> which will penetrate the earth and see something that smaller, shorter wavelengths cannot do. So a microwave can't do that. It'll only go a little bit. These long wavelengths can penetrate the earth and sea, and they're used for communicating with submarines. In fact, some of you might remember the big controversy in Michigan where they were bearing these 26 mile long on antennas and everybody was complaining about the ELF effects. Those were the same idea, but with a ground-based technology. And in this case, we're using a ground-based technology to excite the ionosphere to create a thousand-mile-long antenna, which is the ionosphere, to broadcast this signal back to the Earth. Um, there was a, a transmitter in Tromso, Norway, that's similar to this. And they actually demonstrated this by playing Wagner. So they got the ionosphere to play Wagner for them. You know, and it, the games people play, right? I mean, this is all humor for them, but this is still our natural environment, and they're playing around in an area we really don't have full knowledge of, which is why they're running the experiment, right? Only we are part of that experiment, and these kinds of experiments do not belong in the military's hand. They belong in the open light of day, where a lot of people can take a look and decide whether really this is something we ought to be doing. Um, the other thing that happens here is these signals, these low-frequency signals, as they come down and penetrate the Earth, a certain amount of that signal will reflect back. And with instruments on the ground or traversing the ground with aircraft, you can then use them for what's called ground penetrating tomography. This is the idea in the vernacular by comparison, by analogy, would be like x-raying the earth, although x-rays aren't involved. It's like looking into the earth. And what you can deduce is where underground nuclear facilities are, mining facilities. Um, you can determine oil and gas fields, water. You remember a few years ago, they were circling around Mars, and they said, hey, there's water two kilometers deep on Mars. Did you ever wonder how they figure out it was water and not methane or something else, right? Because we can do this. Do you know that in the United States, as an example, if we were applying this technology, something that we might actually care about, we could survey every oil and gas field in the United States. And you know the interesting thing about that? Most of them are held in common. You and I own those. In fact, if we just looked at the north slope of Alaska, there'd be enough natural gas and oil there to pay off the national debt. Sixteen trillion dollars worth. Mm -hmm. And that's ours. But we give it away to the oil companies, that's just another story for another day, for a few cents on the dollar to tell us how we got a short supply and how we're poor and all this mm -hmm. stuff. We are giving away the treasury. And we have technologies now that are owned by us, because we developed them, that could give us good information. So instead of drilling a bunch of wildcat wells in places we don't belong, we could do things very differently, produce that resource for the public, 
and actually own the resource instead of giving it away. And that's, and that's the thing about a lot of technology is misapplied. You think about the pharmaceutical industry. We spend all the money on the research, so we pay $200 for the drug that sells in India for two bucks. You know, there's something wrong with the way this thing works. And a lot of it is a lack of accountability, and it's your money and my money driving most of the technology in the world today. And, and we need to be thinking about that. Um, Earth penetrating tomography offers incredible possibilities. The other thing, though, that nobody mentions is the frequency range in which these things occur. 1 to 20 hertz. Now, why is that important? Hertz. Cycles per second, pulses per second, vibrations per second. You think about it in, in all of those terms, we're talking about the same thing. This is a predominant brain activity of human beings. 1 to 20 hertz. And let me kind of break that down a little bit. 1 to 4 hertz, delta, this is where you are in your deepest states of sleep. Most people can't do that when awake. Few can. There's some meditators out there that have figured out how to do that, walk around in delta. The next one is theta. Now, this is where three to five-year-olds spend a good deal of their time. If you ever hang around with three to five-year-olds, they're kind of spaced out a little bit. It's where you are between awake and asleep. You know that, that stage where you're awake and you're in your dreams playing with them? Well, that's where these guys are a good bit of the time, and you wonder, well, they don't know the difference between imagination and reality. Yeah, they do. <laughs> they're just kind of diving in and out of it a little more frequently than the rest of us. The next stage, alpha, this is where you are in your sort of zone, your place where you're doing your art, your learning, your accelerated learning, this space, um, the zone, some people call it, you know, whether you're an athlete or intellectual or an artist, you'll find that space. This is where you're running about, say, uh, 7 to 12 hertz, pulses per second, you're in that space, real rhythmic patterns that show up. Then above that, you get into beta. Most of us are in beta right now because I'm pretty asleep yet and I don't see anybody drifting into Delta yet. So we're doing good tonight. But the point of the matter is, external influences can cause what's called brain entrainment or frequency following response, FFR. And this can be done by a number of different ways. One is you can use electrocranial stimulation, stimulate the cranium of the head and your brain activity will begin to pulse at that same uh, pulse rate. And, and there's uh, electrocranial stimulation devices out there. They're a little sloppy because you've got to use gels and things to get good connections to create the uh, entrainment effect. <clears throat> and the reason you would want to create it or might want to create it is for things like increasing your meditation, uh, relaxation, accelerated learning, um, these kinds of things you can do with, with this type of hardware. The, others, uh, the other is flickering light. Now, do you remember a number of years ago in, uh, in Japan, there was about 700 kids in the hospital with epileptic seizures from watching a cartoon? How many remember that one? Okay, a few people remember that one. And everyone got all excited, you know, oh, horrible, you know, what happened here? They were watching the cartoon, they all had epileptic seizures. Well, the flicker rate, the flicker rate held by that cartoon, I'll tell you how to tell the flicker rate on your TV. Go into a dark room similar to this, you're looking at the TV, look behind you at the white wall and look at the flicker rate. And usually it's all over the map, you know, it's not coherent signals, but occasionally you'll see these very rhythmic patterns show up. Within 20 seconds you'll entrain to those patterns, your brain will lock on, begin to mirror them. Now what's important about that is your brain state will shift and change when you do mirror them. Advertisers know this, there's no laws against this. You can watch television, you go home at night and you're there and your spouse is watching television and you're hollering, Dinner's ready, dinner's ready, and they don't even hear you. They're totally spaced out. Now, everybody's had that experience, right? <coughs> because you're in that low trance-like state. You've come back, you're tired, you're fatigued, you get in front of the TV, and before you know it, you're dropping into that theta-alpha range where you're sort of half in, half out. And now you're being programmed because you're getting the news feed, all the advertising crap about all the drugs you need that you can't even buy because you're not a doctor, and all the things that make you smell bad, taste good, or whatever it is that people are worried about this week, you know, it's all on there. And, and what does it leave you with? It leaves you with fear and anxiety, and then you watch 6 o'clock news to really ramp up the paranoia. You know what happens when a person experiences fear, anxiety, or any of those negative emotions? They get incoherent brain patterns. The very simplest thing for influencing human behavior create the flight and fright response is that. If you can switch that off, you can fall into these coherent patterns. And I'll, I'll get into a little bit of that as we, as we go on uh, uh, tonight. But the point of the matter is, this can be externally driven, so light can do it. Now sound waves, we don't hear those low frequency sounds. So a guy named Monroe developed something else called a bioral beat. How many have heard of bioral beat? Okay, pretty good. So I'll, I'll talk about it. 
15,000 uh, hertz goes in one ear, as an example, which is in the range of human hearing, about 300 hertz to more or less 24,000 hertz. In that range, many of us can hear some of it. Some of us miss a little bandwidth, but we all know about that. It's old age um, and a lot of noise. But what, what happens is when you, when you uh, send in a signal, say, at 15,000 hertz, or pulses per second, and one in the other ear at 15,007, they cross, they create a cancellation effect and leave a beat frequency of the difference. In that case, 15,000 off of 15,007, a beat frequency of 7. Within the ELF range, low frequency range, your brain will begin to mirror it. Monroe discovered it. So, by oral beat with a headset, because you've got to get it in where it's, where it's balancing out correctly, you can create these effects. Now, what happens then is both hemispheres of the brain go into harmony. Instead of one dominating creative or analytical you get a whole brain coherence. Well, this is kind of the way it was supposed to be. You know, God didn't give you a half a brain, he gave you the whole one. Now, some of us might feel like we got a half a brain sometimes, but we got a whole one. <clears throat> now, with little kids, if you think about it, we go to educate them. I use that term loosely. Uh, we go to educate them, <laughs> and the deal is, what, what do we do? We, we indoctrinate them in a certain way. Okay, so. Uh, girls we tend to treat one way and boys we treat another way. So boys tend to excel in math and science and uh, young girls tend to excel in the more creative things, right? And we say that's genetic or whatever we want to call it, but it's not. It's the way we treat people, but the fact is both are wrong because one emphasizes one part of the brain, the other emphasizes the other, and both are meant to work together. And if you look at the brain activity of young children, you see a balance within their hemispheres. You see more energy within both hemispheres kind of evenly sort of distributed and as they get older or educated they tend to dominate one side or the other. And so we really miss it. We, we come out of school with half of what we should be uh, because of this kind of typesetting and the lack of knowledge about what's going on there. And we start kids way too young because the brain isn't developed enough for the alpha beta kind of thinking until around six or seven. So Europeans, you know, they start kids in academic learning around six or seven, mostly seven. In the earlier stages, when they're learning language and social skills and all these things were like sponges is when they're in this sort of half awake, half asleep state. So you teach different things at different stages and instead what we do in this country is we label them earlier. Oh, you've obviously got a detention deficit disorder. No, you've got normal childhood <laughs> going on and inpatient parents that think they have to be academically uh, propelled to a system that's not ready for them and they're not ready for it. Now there are exceptions, but they're not the norm. So when you think about these kinds of effects as a side effect in training, when John Heckscher, the program manager for Harper's Address, addressed this issue, he said, ah, side effect we're not really concerned about. Well, <laughs> a few of us might be, but he wasn't concerned about it because it wasn't their, their target audience, so to speak. But the idea of using um, radio frequency to entrain or to create these effects uh, was something that Persinger at Laurentian University came up with. He published a paper in 95 and said, you know, we could create a complex signal uh, and then just do the normal thing, you know, make people agitated and a little stressed and then just show the normal news broadcast and indict some ethnic group or some country or some individual for being the cause of some of our ills and a certain amount of that anxiety and anger would be directed towards them. And in this country where elections are won by you know, a handful of votes, it doesn't take much to push things around pretty easily. So again, uh, this kind of thing is not, not restricted. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, this is a, a, an interesting book. I mention it a lot when I'm lecturing. Uh, Between Two Ages by Zbigniew Du Brzezinski. For those who don't remember him, he was National Security Advisor Jimmy Carter. Uh, when he wrote this, he was at Columbia University, and he's talking about technology's impact on the, the coming world. And what he essentially does is a prediction of you know, Russia, the Americas, Asia, uh, what's going to happen in Europe as technology advances. And if you read it today, even though it's written in the early 70s, it's like a history. You can read it today, and you look at what happened in all these countries, it's just like uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski predicted. For those who don't know, also he was one of the founders of the Trilateral Commission, which is a big think tank uh, that brings together these uh, globalists that have a better agenda for us than we can come up with, apparently, uh, because they really work hard to get it done. And this is a good example of it, because I recommend it highly. Now, if you read this book around pages 56 to 60, there's a section on some stuff I'm covering tonight. And he's citing a guy named J.F. Gordon MacDonald, who 
was a full professor of geophysics at UCLA, and he wrote a section of the book. The book was called Unless Peace Comes, and the chapter he wrote was called How to Wreck Your Environment. And it was 1969. Mm -hmm. So it was before Earth Day, so we got to give him a little bit of market. And <laughs> what he said was, you know, we could trigger earthquakes and volcanoes and all this stuff that, uh, that our Secretary of Defense recently was talking about. But he was saying that we could manipulate behavior of human beings. If we could ever figure out how to electronically stroke the ionosphere in just the right way to return a signal to the Earth, we could manipulate the behavior of human beings over huge <coughs> geographic areas. That's what uh, Zbigniew was talking about. That's what um, the J.F. Gordon McDonald, who is citing, was talking about. And, and that's what we're talking about tonight. Because HARP is that giant system that can create those effects, either a side effect or a effect. So it's not the only technology. It is just a technology. Let's get there. This is another interesting one, um, Jose Delgado, most of you guys should have heard about him. How many have heard about Jose Delgado? Okay, good mix. Jose Delgado, he was um, studied uh, electrophysiology, University of Madrid, class of 1950. How many people even know a degree in electrophysiology even exists, much less in 1950? You know, but that was him. Now, one of my mentors, uh, Rejo Michaela, he graduated the same institution, same degree in 1958, but Delgado, he started experimenting, and many people remember his experiments. He was using implants in primates and bulls and, and, and other mammals, and then mapping the brain to figure out what part of the brain was responsible for what. And he was doing this at uh, Yale University for many years in the, in the 60s all the way into the 80s. And the thing he's most famous for was he has an implant inside this bull, and the bull is charging towards him, and he throws a switch, and the bull stops, right? Just like a switch. All right, now, what he figured out by the 1980s, you don't need anything implanted in the brain. You just need to know the right frequencies, like tuning a radio. You know, the right waveform, the right energy densities, and, 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 and the right frequencies, you can dial up the emotion of a primate. And so that's what he was able to do. And then he went back to, it was reported here, Whitey he went back to Spain and continued his work there. But this idea of manipulating human behavior from his perspective, and a lot of the guys like him, they thought this was a great idea. I mean, you, you capture the essence of it in the book, physical control of the mind toward a psycho-civilized society, because his view of the world was, gee, we should just make everybody happy. <coughs> this is, you know, if people have asked me this in lectures, you know, wouldn't that be great? And the answer is no. You know, human beings are meant to experience this whole spectrum of emotion, which is what makes us complete and whole human beings. You know, the idea that we ex experience misery as well as we experience love, or just the nature of who we are and what we're doing here. You know, I mean, that's just part of the game plan, right? You perfect what you know based on what you also experience. And most of us, particularly those of us with little gray hair, have experienced some really nasty stuff in our lives, right? But that's the stuff that made us the people that we are. And, and that I mean, we're still standing and we're still smiling and we're still doing our thing because we overcame whatever those obstacles are or we'd be dead. <laughs> and we're all on that same trajectory. We're just on different installment plans, so it really doesn't matter to me. <laughs> but again, you know, thinking about all this uh, as, as, as sort of the direction in which we're going, and, and to talk about folks that really believe that they're doing us a favor. And this is why, again, technology can't be trusted in the hands of a few. We have to generally have some working understandings of what's possible so we can start to be heard about what is reasonable. Because when I talked about that book or that pamphlet, The Revolution of Military Affairs from the U.S. Army War College, what it says in it, it talks about all this technology coming. And it talks about how it will violate the Constitution. Things that, you know, interdict our privacy. Or one example they give is they think a plane's coming in with a boatload of dope and instead, oh, they shoot it down because they provide a little intelligence to the Peruvian Air Force and they, oh, we made a mistake. It wasn't the drug traffickers. It was the missionaries we shot down. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that actually happened. Some of you might remember this, you know. And the story is, who's com who's guilty? You know, we provide that intelligence. Okay, what happened to a trial and a jury? And uh, you know, somebody dealing drugs is not a, a a combatant in a war. All right, they deserve a trial. We need to make sure that's not the missionaries. And we don't do that. We do this other stuff. And and we do it under the guise of, oh, this is for your own safety and security. Now, what that paper said in the 80s is that nobody in America would buy this one. So, instead of the Ar U.S. Army War College saying, bad idea, let's not go this way, they do the opposite. They say, well, how do we convince the American public? And their answer was, we create an environment of fear based on international drug trafficking and international terrorism. 
<laughs> what have you been watching on the news for the last 30 years? Now, I don't want to discount that at all, but let's, let's put it in a little perspective. International terrorism for Americans. Let's assume that everything they're telling us is true. Okay, about all the people that are All right, well, let's just give them a little margin for a minute, all right? Now, there's maybe 10,000 people involved in all that death, right, in America. Maybe even 20,000, we include everybody in combat in Afghanistan and Iraq that we've lost. 20,000 is a lot of people. You know how many people die of medical malpractice every year, according to Harvard University? 100,000. 100,000, right. Now, how many of those make the front page? None of them. Put it in perspective, ladies and gentlemen. And what we're doing is giving up our civil liberties when we ought to be not doing tort reform. <laughs> you know, we ought to be suing the wrong. Okay, we're not getting the straight story. We're getting the paranoia to usher in this revolution in military affairs. And that's what they've been feeding us for 30 years, and they keep feeding us the fear agenda because that makes all the rest work. Because that is the easiest form of mind control, is to just keep people in a constant state of anxiety, and the herd will move. And that's what we are seeing. Look at the national politics. If that isn't a case of the herd moving, 20 years ago, 15 years ago, even, remember when John Dean got up and he was just happy because he got a nomination at the convention and he'd cheer. And they crucified him, right? He was done politically. Now we've got people screaming stuff in church and not even getting out of the pew. You know, I mean, the stuff these guys are saying. What does the rest of the country think of us? Here we are with our finger on the trigger, the best technology in the world to kill people, and we got a circus for the leadership. This is really a dangerous time. You know, no matter how you feel about the politics of the time, it is a dangerous time. People are disengaged when we ought to be engaged. We ought to be looking at a broader perspective and trying to find a way to open the transparency of government back up because 50 years of secrecy syndrome has not done it for us. Let's catch another slide. This is a great one. You know, when I was thinking about uh, the mind control issues, I'm, I'm sitting in a book room, and this is a big surplus book room, and I'm talking to a guy about, I really want a primary piece of evidence, you know, something that people like you can sink your teeth into and go, yeah, there's something that you can go read off the shelf. Well, this one was one I reached out unconsciously and grabbed this book out of the box behind me, and there it was, the one I was looking for. And this one is uh, was put, in, put together after the CIA was invested. Remember the CIA? Oh, excuse me. The ex-CIA guys have broken the Watergate. <laughs> you remember that? Ex-CIA, right? Yeah, ex uh, so He's got six feet of dirt on top of him. <laughs> but, but they broke into the Watergate. And, and they also broke into everybody's mail, and the CIA was infiltrating community groups like this one and uh, tapping congressional phone lines. You know, doing a lot of things that kind of made the government, at least those who were still thinking they were the government, really upset. And so they did this investigation, they put this big team together and they decided, wow, you know, the CIA, they've been experimenting with LSD and all these drugs and there's 140 projects and they victimized Americans for mind control purposes. And oh my gosh, they really did invade all our mail and search all our stuff without permission. You know, the thing about the CIA, they're supposed to be doing anything on the U.S. soil. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute. This is going on then. This is going on now. Our government, and all of us know it, because we've all seen the evidence of it now. They kidnap people, they torture people, they dig through garbage and they blackmail people, they extort people. We send pallet loads of money to Iraq and Afghanistan, other places where we bribe people. Those are all felonies, okay? We have a felonious government that's supposed to represent us. I'm not a felon. I don't think very many of you are felons or ever have been. And this is an insult to the very character of the country and what we're supposed to represent to the rest of the world. This is the way our government operates. Accountability is the missing link. This is a symptom of it. Whatever those things are you're upset about in the government, it's a symptom of the same thing. Lack of transparency, lack of accountability, and lack of responsibility, and lack of engagement by the general population starting to say, hey, when does it end? And I, I kind of have an idea when it's going to end. It's not going to be a pretty picture, but it's, it's coming. So this is a really important document because it really lays it out, and nothing has significantly changed. Let's go to the next one. Now this is another one, Captain Tyler. Now this guy, fortunately he's retired uh, and is out of the picture, but he was the guy that used to send around to snoop around to see what's going on in the alternative world, right? So <laughs> wherever you are, you're probably here, your friend. Uh, 1984, <laughs> low-intensity conflict in modern technology. Now this is Maxwell Air Force's base deal, and it's a big volume and it's worth looking at. 
But the thing that, the reason I show this slide is the kind of stuff they were looking at were these weird things back then, you know, in the 80s. They were looking at things like acupuncture and regeneration of tissue using light, uh, regeneration of bone fractures using lasers, all these kind of bizarre things they couldn't really explain by the modern physiology and the way that we looked at physical health. So they were interesting because if you could kind of figure out how you could heal people using this, maybe there's a reverse possibility. You might be able to use the same knowledge to kill people. Well, it's kind of that military is kind of in the killing business because that's what we want them to do. We want to be really efficient. Um, they accuse people like me of being paranoid, you know, nervous, paranoid people. You know, that's the military's job. And because that is what they do. Their job is to think of every horrible situation that could ever happen and make a plan about it. That is their job. That's not paranoid thinking. That's just who they are. That's because that's what we pay them to do. Think about the bad news and let's get a plan. So when bad news happens, we're, we're in it. Well, that does breed a little bit of paranoid thinking, if you know what I mean. And so that's why civilians run the government as far as the military is concerned in our country, because we know that. What's happened, though, is it's flipped around. Now it's just a dog and pony show of bureaucrats selling the politician on their latest, greatest, <coughs> slickest piece of hardware they want to have. And then the bad news is a lot of that money spent, like Air Force in the 90s was spending up to 40% of their equipment budget. Now that's a lot of money, you know, when bombers cost a billion. 40% on black projects, so classified even the Congress didn't get to see those. That's a lot of money going into projects that we don't see any accountability for. And there's another thing to consider in military spending. You know, we look at the United States, we spend 600 billion up to a trillion, depending on what war we're in that year. Right, that's a lot of money. China spends uh, 60 to 100 billion, and we all kind of laugh about that. You ever bought anything from China lately? You get a lot more from China than you do here. Go look at how much it costs to build an aircraft carrier at, at, at a shipbuilding port in the U.S. You know, 70 bucks an hour for ship rights with benefits and the whole program. In China, a couple bucks, a couple bucks an hour. For their money, they get a whole lot more hardware. Those are not fair equations. You know, they do not work. We can outspend them and outspend them and outspend them, but they can outproduce us. They have the most modern factories in the world. They can turn a, a, a factory that's putting out boards for computer games to uh, guidance systems for missiles just as quick as that. I worked at one time at uh, for Texas Instruments at Louisville in uh, Carrollton, Texas. And Louisville is where they build missile systems. And most people think of Texas Instruments are doing calculators. That's a sideline, ladies and gentlemen. They built missiles for NATO and for a whole bunch of other people. And back then we had the most modern factory. It was that one. And they could assemble all kinds of things in really short order. And it was the most modern electronics factory up until about 2000. And that's when the Chinese overtook us. For 20 years we held that place with just that one facility in terms of what they could do. Now virtually everything in China produces in the same way that that factory could then. This is a big difference, a big change. And who's funded that? We did. <laughs> we opened up China, and it went from bicycles to automobiles. Because without trade, they couldn't have done it. And what they did is they followed the what Mao followed originally, which was Sun Tzu, the art of war. Right? They used our strength against us. They created capitalism for their own purposes and built the biggest productive machinery system that the world has ever seen, dwarfing the Industrial Revolution of the West. Pretty smart. You know, Chinese ran the whole show for a couple thousand years, except they had a little intermission in about 1700, and they liked to end it, you know? Nobody changed their philosophy, they just changed the cash register, you know, from domestic to foreign, and, uh, and they got control of the situation. And now the technologies that are advancing, some of these, they've known about for a long time. Acupuncture is an old thing in China, you know? New technologies are coming, they're going to be in a lot of different areas, and anyone any of these countries, or even new ones, could be the next benefactor of, of the great new technology. So this one is, again, pointing the direction of where, where we were headed. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, the mind control. Now, as a topic, economist, everybody knows the economist. This was a cover story in 2002. Didn't get into the meat of it. It really got into the ethics of it. You know, is this ethical? You know, should we be playing this game? <laughs> you know, should we be delving around in people's brains? But when the economist starts taking on, you know, people take a little more credibly. Unfortunately, nothing came of this. You know, the, the few things that we were able to do to bring the issue forward, in the European Parliament I demonstrated some technology at, as their guest talking about non-lethal weapons and HARP. And we actually got a resolution passed that dealt with HARP. Um, I'm going to cite it just because I want to be accurate on it. 
And what, what it was is it was section A40005 forward slash 99 was a resolution number from January 28, 1999. And there were four sections. Now this was in a larger uh, resolution. It was a resolution that dealt with security and disarmament, most comprehensive security and disarmament resolution they ever passed. In our testimony that we'd given the year before, we said as part of that testimony is that the United States would unilaterally abrogate the ABM treaty, would dump it. And that committee wouldn't it wouldn't stand for it. I mean, that's one point they stopped me, interrupted, went on the record, says, no, we can't agree with you. This won't happen. We would be informed. We would know. This is a foreign affairs committee. This is a security subcommittee. We would know this. Okay, I let it go. I was wrong. It wasn't a year. It was 10 months when Senator Stevens got up on the floor of the Senate and said exactly what I told the rationale would be. There is no Soviet Union. Therefore, there is no treaty. And it was abrogated by Bill Clinton. So we did it. Ten months before they knew, we knew, and we didn't know because of some hidden phone booth conversation. We knew by just reading the literature and the deduction, the logical deduction is, <laughs> you're not keeping a treaty when you've got such a better game in town. You're going to advance it, and, and that's exactly what we did. And so we got the sections on hard passed, and then we had one other section added in which really dealt with, with something we wanted them to address, which was uh, the non-lethal weapons. This is what it says in section 27 of the resolution. It calls for an international convention introducing a global ban on all developments and deployments of weapons which might enable any form of manipulation of human beings, unquote. Now the way we got it is we demonstrate technology could do it, and we gave them three feet of unclassified documents that could prove it. And we did it over a year's period uh, with several trips over to Europe and working with people, and first the Greens, and then the Conservatives, and then the Social Democrats. We were able to get a coalition of three, which in Europe is, you're done. You know, you got those, everything else is, doesn't matter much. And we did. We got that to form based on what we presented. It didn't have to do with conservatives or liberals. It just had to do with human beings. And people could embrace that and do something about it, or at least take steps in that direction. What's happened in the interim is a great deal that's taken us a different direction. On, on the mind effect stuff, I've done a lot of uh, presentations. Um, a lot of different uh, views of this issue, and, it's, and it is highly controversial. Um, so what I can say is a few things I want to I want to say very clearly. First of all, I'm referencing a lot of things, and you obviously don't have time to look them up. If if you're going to change one single aspect of your behavior based on anything I say, look it up, or anybody else for that matter. I take what I say very responsibly. Um, I think when, when speakers speak and they ask people to consider these kinds of issues, that you have a responsibility to yourself to verify what we're saying. Now, a few of my books got picked up here. If you look at them, they're all very heavily footnoted in the four titles that I still have in print. There's 1,600 source documents. Um, we've got a couple librarians over here from your local library at the university. If they don't have it, I'll bet you they can find it. And so look some of those references up, particularly those of you with some science background, and take it another step. You know, I mean, I'm not a physicist. Somebody asked me a question that's more in towards physics tonight uh, during the break. And so I'm not a physicist. I can't answer that. I'm not a scientist. I'm a reporter. What I do is get the information. I dig it out. I talk to a lot of really smart people who are scientists, who are a lot smarter than me. And then I try and put it down into plain language and bring it back to you so you can understand it. Because my belief is the concept we can all understand and building the hardware, we don't have to do any more than building our cars, yet we can still drive them to the meeting tonight. So I, I look at this the same way. Technology we can drive uh, and it drives our political processes, so we need to know a little bit more about it than, than we do, uh, but we don't all have to be a bunch of engineers uh, in order to weigh in on this. And that bothers a lot of people in science because they think unless you have the pedigree uh, that you don't have a right to say anything. And this is a big mistake. And they also, at the same time, many of these same people say, oh, but I'm just a scientist. I'm not responsible for what happens with this science. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You're responsible for what you do with the genius that you have and how you decide to apply it. And if you decide to apply it in a way that's destructive, I got a flash for you. You're responsible. You know, and, and if you're that smart and you can do these things, find a better place to work. You don't have to work for these guys. Make a different choice. Go to work for someone else. Really smart people can. You know, when we first started this work, we didn't go, oh, those guys are our adversary. We went the opposite way. We said, let's send them all the information we can and see if we can change their mind on the belief that, because we had the distribution list. You know, I got this 
internal document, right, that wasn't supposed to be published in the course of this, a technical memorandum. Okay, now I've been in government a long time, and I've been in and out of it, and I've seen a lot of memorandums. This one was 630 pages long. All right, that's a memorandum, man. That's two volumes thick and over a ream of paper. I mean, this was a memorandum, and they said, but it's a memorandum, it's private communication between the parties, and therefore it's exempt from the Free Information Act, and this hasn't been published. Now, they distributed 80 copies of 600 pages, which is a stack of paper to the ceiling. But it's exempt from the Free Information Act because it's a little preamble of this is a non-published document, this represents private communication between the participants of this conference. Well, the conference was the one to set up the design specifications to build HARP. All right, so it's all their overheads, all their graphs, all their information all fed in, and the guy who distributed this guy named John Heckscher, and Heckscher, he didn't know we had it. And how did we get it? By this, not this particular librarian, but someone cut from the same cloth that was knowing that we were doing this work, and their library at the Geophysical Institute in Fairbanks knew I kept making these requests from LUSAC Library in Anchorage. And LUSAC was one of the 78 um, depositories of federal records. So it was one at the time. There's probably more now. But at that time, any federal record that wasn't classified, they had to produce it for you for free. So for research, it's just like a really handy thing. So we kept making these requests and stuff would go up. And then I get a call from the librarian who I've been working with. And she says, Nick, come down to the library. i got two things for you. you got to pick them up. you got to bring them back today. Well, what's the day? Well, I never requested these when I got there. And this this technical memorandum. So I took it over to the Xerox place and had a copy, a bunch of copies of it, and took the others back and so they could go back to Fairbanks and get reshelled. Now, she didn't do anything wrong, but she didn't have a legitimate request. She just knew, given what I've been reading lately, <laughs> I'd probably really like this one. And here's the thing about it. Is it's, a, it's a side step. Instead of recognizing that there's a law called the Freedom of Information Act, they find ways to work around the law. This is it, you know. I mean, I, I remember taking one of John Hexer's letters he'd written to Jeanette James, one of our local legislators in Alaska. And in the book, Angels Don't Play the Harp, I used that letter as an example for how the government lies. So I took what he said and then showed the evidence of why it was a lie and attached it. Well, when Jeanette James read that, it pissed her off, you know. She's been lied to by these clowns who are asking her for help. So she holds a hearing. And we get to go to the hearing, produce our experts, they produce their experts. And we had this lively debate. Well, our next round, we were bringing Ben Eastland to the dance, because he agreed to, to attend, and they were going to bring ARCO, and then we were going to ask ARCO to release him from a secrecy agreement so he could talk freely. And what happened is Jeanette James got intimidated by Senator Stevens at the time, who said, you hold another hearing and your political career is over. Now, she said that on the air in, a, in, a, in an interview, that that's what happened. And this was Stevens' program, uh, the way he operated up until he was taken out of office from my brother being. But the fact is, these guys really believe that they can dictate and drive public policy, and when there's actually a discussion going on, that they can just go shut it off for their own political convenience. That is what is wrong. That politicians can be intimidated and that they are intimidated. That's what's wrong. We don't have the best leaders because Mediocrity is a little easier because anybody who's ever done anything in life has probably screwed up a lot too. And I, you know, kind of my measure of a person is, I don't want to elect anybody who hasn't screwed up really good and come out of it whole and intact. It can stand back up on their own two feet and hold their same values. That's the guy I want or the woman I want representing me. I don't want to discover what they're made of when the disaster happens. I want to know, you know. It made, it made the woman I'm dating a little nervous when I wanted the, the train wreck information first. From the train. <laughs> but the principle applies, I'm telling you. you know, and, uh, and it really does, because what makes us strong as human beings is the experiences that we have. And, and I think the negative ones tend to draw out the best in, a, in us. And what I said earlier, that I think the country will go through a lot of tough times, but out of the other end of that, this is what I'm referring to. I think we are in for a tough go in a lot of ways. And out of that maybe comes a different way of viewing the world and one that brings back some humanity to it. Um, let's go ahead and flip another uh, slide. Now this one, I show this because this, this is kind of a, an important one because this is the Navy's rules for human experiments. Okay, now we, we, it is from, from 2006 and, and this is what requires 
um, a deputy secretary to approve is severe or unusual uh, intrusions, other physical or psychological or human subjects such as consciousness altering drugs or mind control techniques. I mean, they don't even kid us about it. They put it right in there and they say, these are the things that they can do with throwing the government. Now, how many people know those things are even going on today, right? This is going on. They got permission. This is just the Navy. The Air Force has their programs through the Electromagnetic Directorate. They have a publication called Technology Horizons. And in 2004, the June issue, you can look it up, is an article about controlled effects. And it's the Air Force take the Electromagnetic Directive of what is coming. And so they talk about controlled effects covering three areas. First of all, hardware and heavy equipment. You know, the, being able to alter... Um, equipment by interfering um, with computers or hardware. The next one is strictly uh, creating um, uh, electron flows in computers that cause them to malfunction, so software is not running right. And the third controlled effect is the human operator, where they believe that, that, that we are at the threshold of where we can duplicate all of the senses, sight, sound, touch, taste, smell, yeah. in such a way as we can create complete illusions mm. that appear to be real memory sets that are as real as the experience that you're having here tonight. Now, what's interesting about that is this is the direction our military is headed for lots of different reasons. One, on the one hand, for screwing up the adversary by being able to put things in their head that shouldn't be there. And the other is to download information for training purposes to equip our uh, men and women for combat in a more rapid way. Now, the problem is, when you think about this, there are a couple contracts let, uh, let by DARPA um, a few years ago, just, just about just a few years after this, about 1908 through 1909 was the RFP that I saw, which was really encouraging people to come forward with all these new technologies to show us how to do this stuff. Now, when you think about mind control <coughs> techniques, the MK Ultra programs are the ones that most people think about, and these are the ones that came out in that CIA report. This was 144 programs operated by the CIA from the 1950s, 60s. Uh, and, and into the 70s, eventually leading to the church committee investigation, a congressional investigation where they threw the book at them, and a guy named Gottlieb was in a room shredding documents real rapidly as they were having the hearings. Because nobody wanted to go to prison for the kind of stuff they were doing because a lot of them belonged in prison. Secretary of Energy O'Leary during the Clinton administration said, half a million Americans have been victim of human experiments in the United States over a 40-year period. Half a million Americans without consent human experiment, spent on subjects. These are who they admit to in this country. All right, what do we do elsewhere? We don't even know the half of them. What kind of experiments? And you've read about them periodically in the paper. You might remember um, injecting black Americans with syphilis in the southeast United States and watch what happened to them over a few decades. Uh, radioactive iodine in, in Nupiates, uh, what we used to call Eskimos in the north, to see how they would handle radiation in Arctic conditions. And on and on and on, and no accountability. You know, these are the same people that bring you kidnapping, torture, extortion. You know, I mean, come on. This is our government. This is the problem with the secrecy syndrome. When this can happen, when they can admit a half a million Americans, and no one says a word. You know, terrorism's a big deal. We're talking to half a million Americans, by Americans, for Americans, for what? To, to defend democracy in the republic? Where do we lose that in the <laughs> shuffle here? This is another example of it. This should not be allowed. This should not be permitted. This ought to be done if it's done ever in the open light of day and not in places like Guantanamo Bay. Next slide. Now I was talking about the whole brain effect, whole brain coherence. Now this comes from um, Hemisync, and I have the Hemisync with me, some of them with me. This is a... Uh, the idea is, is you're again using a bio OB to create a full brain coherence. This is a graphic example of what, what happens uh, before when energy is distributed sort of randomly in certain areas of the brain more than others and then with, with hemisync artificially driving the brain in such a way as to create a, a whole brain effect. The next slide. This is right out of the patent. Um, this is the before shot. And you look up top at the incoherent kind of scattered um, brainwave activity flight or fight response, just sort of the normal clutter or chatter that people are experiencing. Next slide. This is with Hemisync, whole brain coherence, 
a more rhythmic pattern in the brain that's what's associated with higher order thinking, creative processes, and um, anomalous human capabilities are usually associated with this kind of uh, brain patterning, more rhythmic, um, more, more, more clear, and more balanced between the hemispheres. Um, when I say anomalous human functioning, we used to call those things extrasensory perceptions. The military now calls them something different because extrasensory perception has some kind of religious connotations to make people nervous. They get a new name, you know, it's like, it's like campaign contribution instead of bribery, you know. <laughs> get you to the same place, but they sure sound better, don't they? <laughs> Next one, please. All right. I'm sorry for the humor, but you know, it keeps people awake at least if they're not overnight. Um, and I just can't help myself because it's just the nature of it. You know, these are really heavy topics, but if you get too heavy about it, you get in going on brain powder, she can't get around the conversation. So I'm trying to work on that. Uh, and actually, you know, humor says a lot. I mean, it really does. Because it puts us at ease, it actually breaks that tension and allows us the opportunity to relax again. You know, I'll give a couple of pointers here, side steps of things that we, do, we can do and we do. Um, a, a couple of points on brain entrainment. One you can do without any hardware, you just need another person that you care about. Have you ever done gazing where you gaze in someone's eyes and you hold it? Okay, some of you I see nodding, other people are embarrassed by the same thing. It's okay. <laughs> you gaze in a person's eyes and you hold that gaze and you continue to hold that gaze and what will happen is your brain activity will tend to synchronize, your breathing will synchronize, mm -hmm. and you fall into that place of two or more gathered together and because you now have resonance between you and there's an energy that surges. You can do some other things along that line. You can tone, how many have done that? Forehead to forehead, create the tone, feel it go through your body. You can do a lot of things with energy to create coherence and to create a harmony Breathing is the simplest one for reducing stress. A lot of traditions teach this. Um, but again, stress is your adversary because stress leads to the anxiety, which leads to the fear, which leads to incoherent brain patterns, which leads to the herd moving down the road. And that's the real enemy. Of, of when you talk about mind effects, that is indeed uh, the real enemy. So I want to talk a little bit about some positive effects, and I'm going to flip to another set of, of slides. I think we're getting close to the end of these. So harp on the positive stuff. Weather modification. I heard some things on, I don't remember whether it was here in a radio thing I was doing the last two days, but the question was, well, what about the drought in California? Wouldn't it be nice to take care of that by being able to steer the jet stream down a little more moisture? It would if we knew that we could do that without denying moisture to maybe half a dozen other countries who might get mad at us over it, right? So these ideas, and, and Eastland said it best, is if we're going to mess around with these kinds of things, we do it in the clear light of day. We do it with everybody's involvement and consent, and we do it very, very, very slowly, if at all. We don't do it with kindergartners and hand grenades. We wait till we're making it a little further in the academic line and get a better picture of this planet before we start playing with it on that level. Um, I talked about pollutants being removed uh, using RF. Um, energy weapons as a technology, this is really the direction in which it's all going. You're going to see a, a huge change in this. We're already starting to see parts of it. Um, this is where you'll be able to wage war and yet not create the collateral damage. And this is what, uh, if you think about it, the rebuilding business that we're in, we go over there, we get supposedly justified to have a war, we go have a war, and then we spend 10 years cleaning it up. It doesn't really work very well. You know, I mean, look at Iraq. Okay, we spent 10 years trying to clean up the mess we left, and then we tried to train people to take care of it themselves. We got one guy trained for a half a billion dollars, is that right? We got one guy. Now our guys do 10 weeks, we send them over there, they don't run away. We've been there 10 years. If they don't want a democracy, let them have whatever they want. Because that's not it. And I think that's okay. I was on uh, the radio, on Freedom Radio Network today, uh, with Carol Rosen, who's, who's here. And when I think about that, you know, we're talking about that today. You know, what, what is the limit that we'll set for some of this stuff? You know, are we just going to continue to drift down this technology path that allows us now to sit in Missouri and run some drones in the middle of the Middle East and kill a bunch of people and go home and have a barbecue. Okay, you've taken something out of warfare that's going to make it quite different. When people went to war, they came back from war. And some of you folks here have been there and done that. The last thing you want to see is your kids or your grandkids doing the same thing. Because you still smell it. You still see it. You still feel it. But when you're running a video game from St. Louis, you're going to have a whole different feel. 
And they're going to dumb that thing down so you don't have that same emotional connection with the people that you're wasting on the other side of the planet. So you can go home at night and get some sleep. War is going to be too easy. It's going to be too easy for politicians to say, let's go do it. And that's why it's incumbent on us to say, no, there's a time to say, no, let's not go do it. And the guys in the military, the women and men in the military, they don't get to weigh in, you see. Because they lose that right to speak to their congressmen, to speak out for themselves when they're in the military service, because they have a different role and obligation. We have the obligation to protect them from being abused in combat situations they shouldn't belong in. And that's up to you and I to figure out so that when we send our men and women into combat situations, it truly represents our values and not a bunch of extortionists who kidnap and torture people. Because I don't think that represents any values. Those are not liberal values and those are not conservative values. Those are the wrong values. And we need to take it back. And we take it back one, one bite at a time by getting involved and recognizing the next revolution in military affairs <coughs> ought to be something that heads us towards peace and not towards a better covert operation. When you look at um, <clears throat> some of the metaphors for change and the technology, we've got opportunity here. It's a two-edged sword. <coughs> Changing ourselves is the root of it. I had a question during one of the breaks, you know, how does forgiveness and love fit into this picture? Well, when you actually experience those emotions, you get coherent brain patterns as a starting point. You get the kind of attitude and gratitude that allows for the change. You have the opportunity then for the evolution that is the revolution, which is how we think and how we utilize our brain and how we combine that with our heart to make things change in the world. I think that's the essence of it, quite frankly. The rest of this is kind of window dressing to get us all into the conversation. If we care about this, we all come together here tonight to have this conversation. But these are symptoms of an underlying rot. And, and, and that's about an accountability syndrome and about us taking steps that we can take. And everyone kind of looks out and kind of waiting for the leadership to emerge. And I, and I want to give you a late announcement. It already has. It's here now. It's called the human race. There's no special club. We're already all members. All we have to do is one small thing, that which we know we can do. Whether it's this issue, some other issue, it has nothing to do with anything we've talked about tonight at all. But there's something that each of us believe in that we can push forward. That's within our realm of possibility. In fact, it's something that we know we can do absolutely. And so we can go do that thing, that change thing. Most people want to think about the big picture and what they can't do. Oh, no, I can't do that because of this obstacle and that obstacle. Don't do it then. <laughs> It'll be a train wreck, I guarantee you. Do what you believe you can do about what you care about, and the next thing will reveal itself, and you will do it with absolute confidence. You will do it with the essence of what is true and right for yourself. It's called faith, and faith is simple. It's just doing what you know you can do, not what you can't do. That's how it happens. Anyway. <laughs> Okay, let's go to the next set. And while we're doing that, I want to just carry that a little further. <clears throat> there is a, what I did is I, I generally break this up a little differently. So I'm going to use some overheads from um, another piece of this presentation. So let's skip this one. This is another book title. Um, the best one on mind control over 250 sources. I don't have any more with me. Amazon always has our stuff, but also you can get it on our website, earthpulse.com. Next slide, please. Okay, I want to talk just really quickly because I got not enough time. Um, I'm going to skip some and I'm going to talk about some. Historic points on mind control, Harvard in the 20s. Now, this was the Estabrook work at Harvard University, and he was doing work in their hypnotherapy lab. And what he figured out was that about one out of five people could be taken into such a deep state of hypnosis that if you work with them over about a nine or ten month period, you could actually give them a whole new personality. So you would have this dual person. You know, there you could activate this personality, send them into uh, uh, like Russia at the time, and they could be your super spy. Because they'd go around, they'd see all the stuff that you needed them to see. If they got captured, they would remember who they are. You get them back, you give them a suggestion, they come back to reality and, and download their story, right? So he was creating that super spy, and he actually talked about this. His work became classified in the 30s. Um, he began, he was involved in the CIA group that did the LSD experiments that came out in the 60s. Kind of a neat way to look up these guys is you go to the Library of Congress, look at everything they've published in their life. And then you really get a 
profile because people sometimes have this really weird rocky road in the front end that turns into something at the back end and this guy did some really weird work but what he what he was publishing in the uh, in, in the 60s was he said hey he'd created these kinds of people super spies <laughs> and then you think of the stuff that you hear about when you hear about um, the Kennedy assassination and you hear about some of these guys that do this crazy stuff and they can't figure it out. Well, maybe they're there. You know, maybe these are those sleepers. But the fact is that, that this was a concept developed way back um, and continued to develop um, with Delgado's work, which I mentioned earlier, the CIA's interest, which I mentioned earlier, the presidential investigation, which I showed you that uh, cover. And I talked about uh, Between Two Ages, which takes us into uh, uh, the leader machine in Ross Addy. Ross Addy, Alan Frey, they were both really brilliant guys. Uh, one in microwaves and one in um, really effects of electromagnetic fields, Ross Addy. The Lita machine was a device picked up during the Vietnam War and they had captured this device and it was used um, using flashing lights and strobes to put people in trance-like states so they could extract intelligence from prisoners of war. And we found that pretty interesting. And when you think about mind effects or you think about the word brainwashing, where did that phrase begin? It was right after the Korean War we had returning prisoners of war coming back, and they had been patriotic, flag-waving guys, and all of a sudden, they're back, and what are, they, what are they doing? They're handing out communist leaflets on street corners, and we're just going, what, what happened to these guys? And we got the term brainwashing. And the predecessor of the CIA jumped into all this, and that became sort of their area of interest, and then that one thing led to another, and before you know it, we had the, the CIA doing mind control experiments. Now, a lot of the people that were really smart in this there bright, but they didn't really fit into the academic world because they were kind of nonconformists. So we got a Delta person down here, but that's okay. She's coming back to life. Here she is. All right, so you're famous now. So what happened is, that when, you, when you look back uh, on, on what these guys were doing, all of it was, was just kind of off the center of the mainstream. So they set up organization. One of them was a mankind research organization. Some people remember it run by Navy intelligence and they, they took all these mavericks, all these wild people and they their intelligence and put it in report form and then funnel it back to CIA's Navy intelligence so other people that could use it. And that's kind of the way you sort of kept the people that didn't fit the normal academic mold but were really creative. Now most really bright people I've met, really smart geniuses, they're all really weird. You know how they are. It's just their nature. That's why they are who they are. And it's okay. But they don't fit well in academic institutions. They don't do really well in the military either. They don't stand in lines in the state of blocks. Mm -hmm. So it's important because these guys, uh, Ross was independent but did a lot of work for the military. He died a few years ago. Alan Fry, what he discovered was mm -hmm. microwave hearing. And, and in doing that, he heard this clicking kind of sound that led him to believe that you could actually transmit sound wirelessly into a person's head. And that was later actually developed. Woody Norris who runs a company, its, it's symbol is ADCO, A-T-C-O, you can look it up. He developed um, acoustic heterodyning and won the Lemelson Prize at MIT for it. And what he could do is, in an audience like this, he could send two signals in that would hit somebody in the back of the room and they'd hear that proverbial voice in the, in the head and nobody else would hear a word. Now that's pretty frightening, you know, if you're the person hearing the voice and you're saying, hey, did you hear that? You're, no one's hearing anything but you. That's a scary feeling, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure. And that's a, uh, an active denial system that the military bought, and they say, for guarding perimeters, so when you get too close, they'll tell you. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, well, you know who's talking to me. But it's, it, it is that. I mean, going a little further, that same kind of technology used a different way, different kinds of technology. You can do other things at a distance. You can make people feel, and you may be, remember this, the uh, dish mounted on the Humvee, and it looked like a microwave dish. And when it hit the crowd, they had the sensation of 130 degrees on the surface of the skin. It was a riot control device. Do you remember that one? Mm -hmm. Mod heads. You know, the last time we used uh, heat, or behavior modification, we called it burning at the stake, and we thought it was a bad idea. <laughs> this is the modern version of the same deal, right? Now we do it with the microwave, we used to just do it with a torch. And somehow that's more humane, because we can't see the flame burning, right? This is the problem when you're dealing with the, this revolution in military affairs. Again, you don't see it in the same way. It doesn't really play well on CNN. Bunch of people squirming around. I mean, what are they doing? They got ants or they got radiation? 
you know, what's going on with it. This is a problem because it's not the same, we're not going to index it the same, and it's not going to have the same visual impact. So consequently, we're going to talk <coughs> a lot more of it. Think about non-lethal weapons. <coughs> Those that are forbidden for using international conflicts like certain gases, remember the Chemical and Biological Treaty a number of years ago? That got passed, I think it was just in the 90s, might have been even in the 80s. And everyone goes, yay, great, you know, we got that. And they remember in Moscow in 1999, the very end of the movie theater, where those Chechen rebels were holding all those people and they gassed them all? That same gas they used was forbidden under that treaty that they signed, except that treaty has an exemption in it for every country that signed it. You can use everything in it in your own country. You just can't use it against your declared enemies. That is in every single treaty, including the environmental treaty, which says, you can experiment all you want on your own home turf, just don't do it across the international boundary. The problem is weather doesn't get the idea of international boundaries because they're just artificial lines on a map. So we have these treaties, virtually all of them exempt domestic use. And in this country, in this republic, we ought to have, when we're passing a treaty, a treaty that supersedes domestic law. I mean, treaties are like the super law, right? And we don't have a parallel law writing up with that treaty when it's signed to say, hey, if it can't be used against our enemy, it's not going to be used here. And why not? Because maybe we, like the Russians, might want to use that technology someday at home. In fact, it was the Secretary of the Air Force, not the current one, the last one that said, all these non-lethal weapons our adversaries don't need to worry about because we're going to we're going to test them on our own citizens first. <laughs> well, thank you for the announcement. I hope you make the rest of it public. But that's exactly the attitude that we're dealing with. And non-lethals can be lethal. The definition by the International Red Cross is anything that kills less than 25% of the time is non-lethal. Right. That makes a landmine non-lethal, ladies and gentlemen, because it kills less than 25% of the time. Just removes body parts a little more frequently than that. Now, this is what we're talking about and sort of the semantics of it. Non-lethal weapon sounds good. You'd rather have somebody use a non-lethal weapon. Well, if you have asthma and you get hit with standard gas that is legal, you can die from that. It's not non-lethal. If you have a pacemaker and you get a nice, good jolt, you can die from that. Okay, non-lethal is a misnomer. It just means the guy with the other end of the trigger is more willing to pull it because they don't think they're going to do as much damage. It's not the case. Um, I want to talk a, a, a little bit about this electronically tele, electronic telepathy thing. Um, this is what they let in uh, California a couple of years ago, contract DARPA did. And what they first want to do is like look at brain activity and be able to monitor it in real time as people are having real thoughts and then take and try and recreate those complex signals and transfer them into another brain to see if they can actually have that same experience. And so this is where the science is, is headed today. And the thing that drives it, what allows for the resolution, is going to be computing power. And right now, we probably really don't have the juice we need to do as much as they'd like to. We kind of do gross things, like we can uh, affect emotional states pretty easily, but specific thoughts, that's getting a little more refined. The resolution requires a lot more power. But let's talk about that for just a moment. Quantum computing, which is coming. What does that mean compared to what we do now? A supercomputer today, more or less, uh, 280 teraflops a second. This is a little dated, so it's probably faster. 280 teraflops a second, what does that mean? That's today's computer. That's six or seven billion people with hand calculators every 60 seconds doing a calculation for 60 hours, and you do what our computer does today in a second. Wow, that's a lot, right? Quantum computer, now imagine. That, that a quantum computer running for an hour, the new ones that haven't been invented yet, supposedly, that will do what our supercomputer does in a trillion years. Wow. That means all encryption's obsolete overnight. Whoever gets to quantum computing first wins because every code can be broken. Plus, the predictability of a computer like that would be pretty phenomenal. That must be almost like a magic because it could take in so much data. You know all those data banks storing all your private records all over the world that everybody says, don't worry about it, we can't sort it out. It's not going to matter. That's when it matters. Because that's when you'll be able to sort it all out and use that information. That's why your information should belong to you. Your digital doorway is more important than your doorway to your home. And when the Constitution was developed a few hundred years ago, 
Everybody's worried about someone kicking your doorway. And I'm telling you, you got to worry about someone kicking in your digital doorway. And they didn't even have to. We should own our data. They should not own our data. Private industry, government, nobody. When the data is no longer useful to you as a consumer, credit card transaction. Six months, you got to dispute it, right? After six months, hit the delete button. Nobody needs that data anymore. There's a lot of data that ought to be deleted. And that's the way you protect it a civil society in the 21st century is you give control of our data back to us. Turn transparency around. You know, all your mail, in and out, when it goes through the Postal Service, who you sent to and who it came from. All your phone calls, in and out. All your travel, all your medical, all your buying patterns, all your checks, all your credit card transactions, all that data, all your <coughs> utility bills. I mean, think about all the data that's collected about you and retained. It's, it's gotten to the point where you are transparent and your government is okay. Mm. The cameras need to go the other way. Mm. We need to have a camera in every congressional office. Mm -hmm. What do they have to hide, right? They're our representatives. <laughs> if they're doing something there that they don't want you to see, it's probably something they need to go to jail for. Mm -hmm. I would bet. Turn the cameras the other direction. Wouldn't it be nice if you could dial into your kid's classroom? Not so everybody could, but so you could. See if that teacher is really teaching their kid, or whether your kid's really paying attention. And if he's not, I guarantee you, most people in this room, their kid would be paying attention, you know, because you'd be there. If the teacher wasn't teaching, you would be there. Turn the cameras the other way. Make government accountable to the people again. Don't let them hide behind, oh, it's our privacy too. No, it is. You give certain things up to serve the public, and a little bit of your privacy is unfortunately one of the costs of public service. And so, we need to think about that in terms of where it goes. Electronic telepathy, you know, somebody asked me in a conference, it was a close conference, but no public, had a lot of people involved in this field of research from um, Alexander Kabarainen, who was a former head of the biophysics <laughs> lab at the USSR Academy of Sciences and a number of others. And the conclusion that they came to is the next evolution, the next leap in humankind was this idea that we would have these unusual, extraordinary capabilities. <coughs> Not occasionally with those little bits of intuition, those little bits of insight that we have occasionally, but as a pattern. Now, think about that. If, if what we can do artificially, we actually could do naturally, what would happen? I mean, some people have asked this question, you know, if I knew the thoughts of another human being, what could happen? Well, I know a couple things. If we had that capability, and I believe we do, we just don't manifest it. We would have to be very forgiving. It gets back to your question. You asked, right? Because we would have to forgive ourselves. And we would have to forgive each other. And that, my friend, is Judgment Day. When the book of life is open and your life is revealed. And maybe that's as simple as it is. And maybe that is the day when we can see through our government. And they become transparent. And then they fear us. And they shouldn't fear us. I think we should follow the pattern of South Africa. We should create... Truth commissions allow people to come forward and speak the truth and be forgiven. But we are entitled to the truth as a starting point. And we have been denied that truth in our technologies, in the way our government works, in the way much of our economy works. And those of you that follow the alternative news in the world know that it has more reality in it than, unre than the unreality news. Mm -hmm. But it's very convoluted right now. And so much of it is filled with fear. And fear is the adversary. Anxiety is the adversary. Those are the things that break down our capacity to make change, to evolve as human beings, and to change the world around us. And it's only that world around us that we have to change, and the rest will take care of itself. It's a disease that we can unleash called the human race, functioning from a different perspective, and maybe dislodging some of the um, rot that has taken over so much of the world. And it's really corruption when you get right down to it. It's all about that in one form or another. Here we've given it nice names, and I mentioned campaign contributions and bribery as an analogy. And really think about it. What does a bribe get you? Access, influence, and outcomes. What does a campaign contribution get you? Same thing. Go see your congressman. Go visit your congressional office. And go in and say, I'd like to see my congressman. And you'll get about a 30-second photo op. You'll get in, you get a photograph, he signed it for you, and off you go. Go in and write a check for $2,500 or $5,000 for the campaign committee on your way in and ask for a lunch appointment and you get it. That's what's wrong with this republic. Mm -hmm. You know, in Alaska, my brother just ran Senate race. He lost that by 3,000 votes. 
in a state where there are 750,000 people, a couple hundred thousand voters, and $60 million got spent on a Senate campaign. Mm -hmm. Most of it not by the candidates. Mm -hmm. What is wrong with that? Mm -hmm. When the elective office is a cash register, mm -hmm. it's wrong. And when corporations get to have eternal life and the rights of the Bill of Rights, only the difference is, a corporation has eternal life on earth as long as you pay your fees. And it's a mistake. And if corporations have a free and voice like we do, then they ought to be able to be thrown in jail. Like all the people on the board, all the people running those corporations, when they violate the law and create criminal events through their corporation. Jail is the answer, not civil fines, because board members don't like jail. And I'll bet you they would do things differently if they knew that was their potential <laughs> outcome and they weren't indemnified in some false way. Or you level the playing field so everybody can give 100 bucks, including these corporations. But corporations can't put any levers in the voting booth. Mm -hmm. And if you limit us all to 100 bucks, whether you're the, the janitor in the White House or the guy in the White House, you're on an equal footing when it comes to the economics of the playing field. Then you actually got to turn people out. People got to show up who believe in you and wear out some shoe leather. Then we get our government back. You got to take the money out of it. You got to take the influence of the military industrial academic complex out of it. Where you're going to get a more directed and controlled society, one that dictates to us on so many levels um, what is best for us, when it's us who should decide these questions. And we should decide it within the sovereignty of our own country. We need to pay attention to each other and recognize that there's other people in the world that might see it just a little bit differently, and they have a right to self-determination too. Even if it's not our form, even if it's not our way, you should be able to have a theocracy if that's what you want. You should be able to have a dictatorship if that's what you want, or a democratic republic. And what free people should be doing is encouraging people to make that decision within their boundaries and get what they want, instead of running across borders to every other country that they think offers it to them. You know, the best re result is the same result we had. Have a revolution. It doesn't have to be a violent one, but everybody's entitled to one. Our founding fathers knew it. They enshrined it. And we need a new revolution, a new evolution of the human spirit. And this can happen anytime, any place, by anyone. Thank you for being here. I'll take wow. a few questions. Thank you. Um, one of the things that I heard is that the chemtrails can set up a certain context for heart to be used that increases the weather modification. And I've seen uh, online uh, satellite images of the weather patterns coming into the West Coast that, you know, you watch what's being done, and it's very convincing to me from the description of it that HARP is being used to create the drought in California. Okay, I'll, I'll, I get this asked a, a lot, and here's the, the, here's the, the partial answer and the partial not answer. The partial answer is... Yes, you could do these kinds of things. The other part of the answer is nobody's really monitoring it, at least that I've seen, in a way where I can say this is hard, doing this right now, and this event is occurring. Not to say that it's not. Have you seen those weather patterns? Yeah, I have. You saw them. I've seen those. I've seen the, the stuff with hurricanes when those come through. Uh -huh. And these are all, all, I hear a lot of this. Earthquakes are another one I hear a lot right. about. And some of them say, well, you get these visual effects up in the... Um, atmosphere and ionosphere. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, many people don't realize it, but the Great Alaskan Earthquake also had those visual effects. Mm -hmm. Because you have this, uh, you almost have a piezoelectric effect of the Earth grinding right. and creating right. a, an electrical discharge. So there's a lot of explanations for some of the things we're seeing. The contrails, chemtrails, I know a lot of you follow that. I don't follow it that closely. It's not my issue. There's some other guys, Cornicom and others, that are following it a lot more than I am. Um, so I can't comment, except to say you could use chemicals within the atmosphere and you could trigger enhanced events, different kind of events. But for weather modification, you don't need that. I mean, you could do that, but you don't need it. Well, does it look from the satellite images to you that HARP could be causing the drought in California? I would only be speculating. Yeah. And I prefer not to speculate. Okay. But <clears throat> others do and I don't. There's so much in the information in the record that if it's not doing that event, the fact that they can, the fact that you know that our government experiments, we should be demanding the answers. Where did you experiment? When did you do it? And what did your result be? And we're not asking those questions. So we really do deserve those answers. The other is on victims. 
half a million Americans are victimized, what have we done to help those people? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And that again is a big, a big mistake in terms of how we the future. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so back to the next round. I asked you earlier, you said it was a phase the ray. I was wondering how far heart can reach over, like even to us here in the national market, or when you look at next round, the big white dome up on Mount Ashen that puts out frequencies, that's a phase the ray. How powerful is that? Or how, because I, I know you said, Bernard Eastman said that heart could be one. Yeah, HARP's just one one technology. I mean, there's a number of transmitters around the world. There's the old five in the Soviet Union. There's uh, Tromso in Norway. There's uh, Arecibo, Puerto Rico, that all have transmitters, <laughs> phased arrays of some kind. HARP was the prototype for this design. Um, it can reach over the hemisphere. I mean, it can deal with an entire hemisphere. It can reach over the curvature of the Earth. You can slew the beam about 30 degrees directly if you want to mess around with, say, a jet stream in the area. But you have a limit to what you can do with the instrument on the ground, just the way it's engineered. When it's round like that, does it make a difference? Then if it's That's not a different technology. And so I, I'm just not familiar enough with the detail okay. of that. Yeah, they just say it puts out frequencies to monitor how much water is in the clouds. Right. Yeah, you can do that. I mean, the technology is certainly there. I mean, the Earth is pretty, pretty transparent. I mean, if you really look at the whole array of, of technology, it's a question of how they use it, what they use it for, and does it really serve our interests? And a lot of uses that might serve our interests never get explored. I mean, think about military technology developing all the knowledge to kill someone. Well, that same root knowledge about human physiology can be used to save someone. But it's classified. You don't get access to it. It's the biggest crime of all. Is some very fundamental things in science may be being discovered that we don't ever get to explore uh, in the rest of the world. Yes, sir. I'm curious. Uh, I know I'm not alone in sleep disorders and not being able to fall asleep because my mind's too active or waking up in the room right. home, my mind's too active, my dreams all crawl in the place. Uh, wake up at 2.33 in the morning with my adrenal glands going right. crazy. Are there techniques we can use that you're aware of to get our brain waves going yeah. to get our sleep yeah. calm down Definitely. and back to sleep? Yeah. Light and sound devices could be very good for you. If you don't have any history of epilepsy, they can be very good because you can, uh, you can within a minute or two, entrain the brain into a state that will make you relax. I mean, you will relax. I, I mean, it's not, a, it's not something you'll avoid. Yeah. Um, I carry one that's a very simple one called the Proteus. You can find, but there's a lot of devices out there. Light and sound. Again, EarthPulse.com. E A R T H P U L S C has a lot of that. Now, the other you can use that's even simpler is neurobiofeedback, which is like brain biofeedback. And there's a device we carry called the Antens, which muzzle, measures uh, muscle, muscle tension in the forehead. And wh whenever you're stressed, these muscles tense up. And when you relax, they relax, your breathing becomes rhythmic. And this device monitors muscle tension and then gives you an audio, audio feedback in a headset. So you hear the tone. As you relax, the tone drops, and you can adjust the sensitivity. What happens with that is over a month of using a device like this, like one hour a day, think of the most stressful situation and you relax with it, you learn how to do it. After a month, you don't need the device. You'll be able to get to that state on your own because you've essentially trained yourself to do it. And what you'll find is your breathing will go rhythmic, your muscles will relax, and you'll, you'll be able to let that go. So those, both of those are pretty good technologies and they're not, not overly expensive. For sleep disorders. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a, a two-point question. Um, the first one is, what's the effective radiated power of the 180 uh, in, in antenna array that is HARP? And then the second part of the question is, it would seem to me that it would be relatively easy to set up a receiver for that specific frequency and publish online when they're broadcast. Sure. Uh, it, you know, the, so the, the question, effective radiator power, they wanted to get to a billion watts. Not with this array. It won't take them that way uh, as far as the effective radiator power. But that was their objective of, with the eventual size of the array they wanted. And that comes out of that technical memorandum and subsequently the, the contract <coughs> documents. Yeah, you probably could monitor the primary signal because it's in a pretty, it, I mean, they published that bandwidth because they had to get permitted. 
but in their secondaries, being able to simulate things in the ionosphere, they cover 16 decades of frequency from ultra low to visible light in terms of affecting. So how would you really monitor that? So it's just too. It's just. Too it's just too down. much. It's just too much, and that's what. I mean, you might might monitor the primary signal coming off of the array, but after that, I, I just think it's too much. It's just too much to do with simple hardware. There's no simple hardware to accomplish that. You can't just tune in your ham radio and, and understand. This you know, thing. I think people that are close, who have been yeah. close enough to know when they're actually firing, have made some correlations there where mm -hmm. they can pick up certain static patterns that show up that are mm -hmm. obviously coherent, man-made, rhythmic patterns, not just static. So they're pulsing the heck out of those antennas. Yeah, and they're not using them all the time. This is something else. These are used in campaigns. Now, some of you might have read a few years ago, the Air Force said, oh, we're shutting the facility down. And I got yeah. the stack of articles. I won't pull them out right now. But the one article says we're shutting it all down. And then a few weeks later, it's, oh, no. Somebody else has got it. We're not shutting it down. And then the next thing you see is, okay, we're shutting it down. And then another year later, goes by. Oh, Geophysical Institute picked it up. They found the money. And where did they find the money? Well, the same people who were finding it in the first place, but now instead of being a line item in a budget, it's a line item below, below a line item. So it's an expense charged out to this deal. But the same people are using it. The facility is still operating, but it's intermittent based on contracted jobs with either DARPA, Air Force, Navy. Um, or private academic institutions that are interested in experiments in the islands. And, and not all of it is published. Obviously. Not all of it is published. A lot of it is classified. Um, some of it is public. I mean, because again, it's, it's an instrument that ionospheric researchers from around the world really want to get their hands on and use for different, you know, different ideas. The fundamental ideas that are being proven by HARP are now able to, able to take those ideas and now apply them into the development of other weapon systems, which, which was planned. Mm -hmm. It's a developmental prototype. It's just the starting point for this direction using this technology. And I'll take uh, one more uh, question. I've answered yours already, so I'm going to give this gentleman a chance. Is there any evidence for a relationship between global warming and this kind of technology? <coughs> That's an interesting question, um, not, not that I'm aware of, um, but, but I would say this about that, is the issue of global warming that's associated with uh, solar radiation. And, and I got a problem with that, all right, from the standpoint of the ozone depletion and solar radiation comes in, it's supposed to heat the earth, heat the oceans, and then create the like El Nino effect. Now, if you think about it for a minute, when sunlight hits the surface of the ocean, 97% of the energy in that sunlight is reflected away. And 3% of that sunlight is absorbed. And if you've been to the ocean, and all of you have, the deeper you go, the colder it gets because heat rises. So all that heat stays at the surface that the sun is releasing. But when you look at those images, those satellite images of the El Nino, it's a plume. <clears throat> it starts out really small and comes up and spreads out across the surface of the ocean as if it's coming at depth. And that's what I think is actually happening. <clears throat> the volcanologists don't talk to the climatologists because under the South Pacific are 600 <coughs> charted volcanoes. At any given time, a certain number are discharging. And when they discharge, 100% of the energy is absorbed in the ocean. And it would look just like a plume mm -hmm. spreading out, just like it looks like. But they're not looking at it. Now, remember a few years ago, some of you remember, there was a ship sailing in the South Pacific and it went by this eruption that was going on that had created a two-mile long island. And nobody knew it was there until the boat went by. We are not monitoring this. You know, I mean, the most logical source, and the reason I think that is I wrote, I wrote this actually in 95, 96, because in Alaska, we had temperatures in Prince William Sound climb 15 degrees in one year, and everybody's going, how does that happen? You know, and all the Physicists in the world say, oh, you can't absorb all that solar radiation that fast. That doesn't happen. But you have the 2,000-mile Aleutian Trench and a chain of volcanoes called the Aleutian Chain that at any given time, a certain number of them are discharging. And a lot of it, I mean, just, just use a simple thing and say, well, if three-fifths of the Earth is covered by water, maybe three-fifths of the volcanic events are also happening underwater, all right, and we're not monitoring it. That, to me, seems a more logical explanation for heating within the oceans and being able to retain that kind of heat charge. It has to come from underneath. 
the other thing I would say if you follow the solar cycle, go back to 1900 and look at the solar cycle and compare it to the weather cycle, they're just a little delayed, but they go like this. They're just right together. Then you look at the footprint of CO2, which World War II, right, the big industrial push. You would expect after that, you know, we put a lot out there in the environment and kept it out there after the war, right? Well, for 20 years after the war, in fact longer, it went until 1980, the earth was cooling. During that whole period, it's getting colder and colder as we're filling up the atmosphere with more and more. So I think it's solar, okay? I think that most of global warming is a solar event. 97%, 97% of greenhouse gases that we're concerned about are natural. 1 to 3% man-made. I think the variable is nature <laughs> and the solar cycle. And I think someday we'll see that. Man plays a part. And the reason I don't really scream about that and get involved in that issue is because I think the particulates that are getting discharged in the atmosphere are way worse than whatever we're thinking about global warming. Because those colloidal minerals and constituents and chemicals and elements are flying all around the world and being ingested every day. And those are having profound effects. I mean, look around um, at some of the things that you see manifesting in the world in terms of cancer or disease that's related uh, to particulates. False hormones in the environment, another big thing that comes in the same way, causing the feminization of species, which we've read about, some of you've read about. MIT did a great study on this. So there's a lot going on in a lot of these areas. With that, i got to stop. We're five minutes after the hour. I thank you all for being here, and thank you for being here.